How could the lightning rod terrify and offend people? It's only a piece of metal connected with wire to the ground. Well, I'll tell you, and along the way, I'll tell you how the lightning rod was invented because of a misunderstanding, irritating lightning bells, a Franklin chamber pot, a terrible earthquake, and how dangerous it was to ring church bells. Ready? Let's go. Electricity, 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 electricity. The lightning rod was invented in 1749 by Benjamin Franklin because he got a little bit confused. He'd been playing with electricity for three years, ever since a friend of his had sent him an article about strange and fun electrical tricks he could perform. Anyway, he became convinced, as we are today, that lightning strikes were the same as the sparks he was getting in his laboratory. Now, Benjamin Franklin wasn't the first person to have this thought, but he was the first person to think of experimental ways to prove it. Franklin started by building a model of an electrically charged cloud. They couldn't exactly get a thundercloud in his room, but he wanted something that he could hang off the ground that could store a lot of charge, irrespective if it looked cloud-like. So therefore, he built a very light tube and coated it with gold, about 10 feet long and one foot wide. He hung up the tube with silk cords and charged it up with his spinning static electric machine. If he approached the charged cloud with a blunt instrument, the cloud would discharge with a large crack and a flash. If he approached with a thin tapered needle, the spark would be less dramatic. He then turned the experiment around. This time, he had one person hold a thin metal needle close to the cloud before he even charged up the cloud. When he ran the static electricity machine, the stick would get a steady stream of quiet sparks and he could not charge up the cloud at all. Extrapolating to nature, Franklin decided that a pointed metal stick could prevent clouds from becoming electric and creating lightning strikes in the first place. Franklin said that, quote, rods of iron connected with wire down the outside of the building to the ground would draw the electrical fire silently out of a cloud and thereby secure us from that most sudden and terrible mischief of lightning. It was because of Franklin's theory that you could safely drain the clouds of electricity that Franklin came up with a way of proving that lightning clouds were electric in the first place. You put a metal pole with a kink in it on an insulating stand in a little box so that everything stays dry. And when an electrified thundercloud passes by, the pole will get electrified too. As electricity tends to collect at points or kinks, one could get sparks from the kink in the pole. A man named Thomas Dalabar actually successfully did this in France in May of 1752. Franklin planned on attempting this experiment by putting a pole in the steeple of a church, but the construction of the church was going slowly. So a month after Dalabar did his experiment in France, Franklin flew a kite with a metal pole in it tied with a wire to a key. Franklin and Dalabar knew they weren't getting struck by lightning but they mistakenly thought that the electricity from the cloud was silently draining into the pole of the key. In fact, the electric charges were stuck in the cloud. However, the charges in the metal rod or kite were repelled by the cloud and moved by induction, or moving charges at a distance, to the kink in the rod or the key. Watching sparks stream from a pole due to a distant thundercloud seemed to verify Franklin's theory that the pole stuck into the ground would drain an electrical thundercloud of its electricity and thus save people from lightning strikes. In fact, at the end of his paper about the success of his experiment in France, Dalabart mentioned that, quote, perhaps no more than a hundred iron rods would be necessary to preserve the whole city of Paris from lightning. Despite the fact that the original motivation behind the lightning rod was flawed, the lightning rod that we use today is basically as Franklin originally designed it, a iron rod placed on a roof with a wire connected to the ground. However, it never worked to silently drain electricity from a cloud. Why not? Well, it's because thunderclouds are farther up in the sky than Franklin realized. In order to bridge that gap, the lightning cloud must have tremendous charge and therefore it strikes with tremendous power. So if it doesn't work, why do we use it? Well, it doesn't work to stop lightning strikes from happening, 
but it does work to save us from its terrible mischief. This is because electricity easily flows through metal, but has a difficult time flowing through glass or brick or cement. Therefore, when a lightning strike strikes a lightning rod, the electricity safely and easily flows through the wire and into the ground. After a few years, even Franklin started to see this advantage of the lighting rod, writing Dalabart that, quote, pointed rods erected on buildings and connected with wire with the earth would either prevent a stroke of lightning, or if not prevented, would conduct it so that the building should suffer no damage. Back in 1752, two months after his kite experiment, Franklin constructed a lightning rod on his house with a small gap with bells and a clapper to warn him when the rod was electrified. Supposedly, Franklin's wife, Deborah, was not fond of the bells and asked him how to keep them from ringing all night when he was off on his many travels. Franklin also installed lightning rods without bells in several buildings in Pennsylvania, including at a church at the University of Pennsylvania at the Pennsylvania State House. By the next year, he published in his Poor Richard's Almanac the details of how to secure buildings from mischief by thunder and lightning with a small iron rod. In South Carolina, a doctor managed to recreate Franklin's kite experiment but was restrained from installing lightning rods by his nervous neighbors. Why were they scared of a piece of metal? Well, the fundamental reason was religious. See, lightning was God's judgment on man. It was the height of hubris to get in the way of God's plan. Franklin tried to quiet their nerves by saying, quote, surely the thunder of heaven is no more supernatural than the rain or sunshine of heaven. And there are no qualms about roofs or umbrellas. That did not quell the anxiety. France's leading expert on electricity, a man named Abbe Nollet, he was mentioned a lot in the last video, said, it was as impious to warn off heaven's lightning as for a child to warn off the chastening rod of its father. In 1755, a terrible and unusual earthquake hit Boston, and a local reverend blamed it on the lightning rods invented by the clever Mr. Franklin. He said, oh, there's no getting away from the mighty hand of God. By the way, lightning rods and lightning do not cause earthquakes. Ironically, as churches tended to be the tallest buildings at the time, and with nice pointy crosses on top, they were often the most struck by lightning, often leaving, say, houses of ill repute nearby untouched. Ringing bells was supposed to help but just tended to be dangerous for the bell ringer. For example, in Germany, over the course of just 33 years, around 400 church towers were struck and 120 bell ringers were killed. Over the following decades, there were continual debates, riots, and even battles in the courts over Franklin's heretical rod. However, the debate against the lightning rod was a losing one because it worked and worked well. Towers that were destroyed multiple times a year never had any trouble again once you added a little wire and a little metal stick. Still, the debate over the lightning rod went well into the 1780s. Franklin never tried to make a penny off of his many inventions, including the lightning rod. That combined with his wit and charm made him incredibly popular among all levels of society. He was fawned over and his image was put on every item imaginable. Supposedly, the King of France got so irritated with his mistress gushing over Franklin that he gave her a chamber pot with Franklin's image on the bottom. 20 years after Franklin's death, John Adams, a man who personally disliked Franklin, wrote that, quote, the invention of a lightning rod was one of the most sublime that has ever entered a human imagination, and that Franklin's reputation was more universal than of Leibniz or Newton or Frederick or Voltaire and his character more beloved and esteemed than any or all of them. There was scarcely a peasant or citizen who was not familiar with him and who did not consider him a friend to humankind. Franklin became a little distracted from his electricity discoveries in the 1760s and 70s by the American Revolution. In fact, all of Europe and America seemed to be focused on politics and revolution. Electricity parties went out of fashion and aside from a few more people accepting lightning rods and a man named Coulomb discovering an equation for the force of electricity, 
very little happened with electricity. That all changed in 1791, when an Italian anatomy professor named Luigi Galvani happened to put a dissected frog near an electricity machine. Then, due to Franklin's experiment, he took the frog outside in a thunderstorm and ended up inventing the battery. That strange story is next time on The Secret History of Electricity. Electricity, 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 electricity. Thanks for watching my video. Please remember to give it a nice thumbs up. Also, if you haven't seen it already, I recommend watching the previous video about the true story about Ben Franklin and the kite. And make sure to check out the next video about Galvani and the frog and the invention of the battery. It's one of my favorite stories in the entire history of electricity. Thanks for watching my video. Remember to subscribe to my YouTube channel, Kathy Loves Physics, or my Facebook page, Kathy Loves Physics. Have a good day.